My name is Francisca de Jong. I'm uh, the executive director of, of Claire and Eric. Um, and this is a workshop that takes place in the context of a European project that is run by uh, Claire and Eric and a few other institutes in, um, in the community that can be labeled Clarin, and that project is called Clarin Plus. Um, as I suppose that many of you, yeah, uh, I suppose that many of you are familiar with Clarin, but some of you may not um, have attended presentations uh, on Clarin or uh, have been able to, um, to ask questions. So I think it would be good to uh, try to summarize the, um, the quintessence of, uh, of of Clarin. Um, so here I have uh, a short summary in four bullets. Good afternoon. Um, Clarin stands for Common Language Resources uh, and Technology Infrastructure. And it is a kind of infrastructure, a research infrastructure, that provides easy and sustainable access for scholars in the humanities and the social sciences and beyond. Uh, we could discuss uh, this list of disciplines and the uh, potential extension later on. It gives access to digital language data in all formats, written, spoken, video, combinations, um, so multimodality is also an issue. It gives access to uh, language data and in addition it gives access to advanced tools to discover, explore, annotate, analyze, and combine those data um, wherever they are located and uh, for the various purposes um, that scholars need to be um, supported in during their, their work. So this is a very general uh, story um, which is more or less in place uh, since uh, uh, some five years when Clarence started with a uh, uh, to be active as a consortium of nine countries. Currently, we are 19. On this map, you see only 17 because very recently we uh, um, could welcome Hungary and, and Latvia as uh, number 18 and number 19. Um, so we're growing and um, getting stronger. And Clarin Plus is a project that will help us to, uh, to strengthen our position and to become better prepared uh, for the stages to come and to build a sustainable infrastructure. As I said, um, Clarin is an infrastructure, a research infrastructure that helps scholars and, and, and scientists um, in their work that is um, making use of language data. So in a way you could position Clarin in, in the domain of data science, because language is a data type. Um, so you could say that Clarin is providing analytics for text and speech data as a pillar for data science. And if you consider that uh, a bit longer, it, it means that um, Clarin has the potential to contribute to the development of new methodological frameworks, because data science is, on the one hand, it's, it's a hype, it's uh, a buzzword uh, that can mean anything um, that you need for the kind of uh, message that you want to bring across. But if you, if you really take it seriously and, and try to ignore the buzziness of it, um, data science without taking into account uh, the contribution of, of textual data um, is incomplete and that means that in developing data science we, we need to contribute to the development of new methodological frameworks and um, uh, those, in those frameworks should uh, aim at the integration or the integrated processing of multiple data types and thus also uh, for it plays a role in the development of a multidisciplinary research agenda or multiple agendas. Another angle in the mission um, or pillar uh, in the mission of, uh, of Clarin is given in by the fact that language, specifically in, in, in Europe, um, comes in many flavors. So multilinguality is a basis um, for what we are doing, but 
seen from the from the angle of data science, you could see that you could say that because of the multilinguality and uh, the fact that multilinguality links the data type to various regions and and, and countries, uh, Claren has the potential to um, support comparative research in in the so uh, of all kinds of societal phenomena, and in particular, of course, those that uh, that are reflected in. Uh, in language use, which means that we could contribute to the study of migration patterns, the study of intellectual history, the study of language variation, and that list can be made much longer. So, uh, Clarin is working on text and speech as, as data, or more precisely, Clarin is working towards the support of a research that takes text and speech as social and cultural data. Um, from this mission, uh, you can easily infer that there are various textual data types, or language data types, that are of, interested, of interest uh, to this mission and to the community of users, HIPO, uh, that we want to serve. So here I give um, a list of, of data types that is diverse and not complete, um, but it is uh, good to be aware of the of the diversity of data types and the research agendas connected to it. Um, if you want to uh, discuss the mission of Clarin, so the, I, I suppose it's easily readable, but um, uh, the dots indicate the things that are not in there. But clearly, newspaper archives fit into this list. Um, some of these data types have been the starting point for uh, a specific action line within this Clarin Plus project that I mentioned in the beginning. Um, and those are the four types listed here. Uh, oral history collections, newspaper archives is here, parliamentary records, and social media data. The Clarin Plus fund that we, that we have makes it possible for us to organize uh, this series of workshops with the aim to reach out to new communities of users, each of them, each of those four workshops focusing on, on one of those specific types. And these users are ideally diverse. So they, are, they could be people working on, on the data type from a natural languages processing point of view, but that would be too limited. We really want to reach out to other communities in the social sciences and humanities. And um, so we have invited all the countries that you represent to think of the possibility to send a couple of people, uh, one with a more technical background and somebody that represents the potential use for, in this case, newspaper data. Can I ask, did we manage to get couples in? Could you <laughs> raise your hand? <laughs> okay, you're one of a couple, okay. Uh, no, that's, uh, this is something that we should try harder, I think. Uh, and, and of course that's not easy because um, time is scarce and uh, uh, limited and, and all that. But we have the budget to do that. And one of the advantages of that model is uh, that you start building <coughs> A collaboration or that you start contributing or supporting uh, a collaboration within a country uh, but uh, that is um, partly as a result of this workshop could be mirrored in other countries so um, we thought that th this could be a good starting point for creating an oil stain uh, effect where uh, the collaboration uh, in the local areas or within the countries uh, gets an, yeah, inspired by what comes out of, of this workshop and then they start reaching out to people within their country uh, to tell the story from both angles, the technical perspective and, and, and the user uh, aspect. And then they would know to identify couples in other countries to start projects on comparative um, uh, questions. Okay, um, so this is 
the prehistory of this workshop is on the one hand the Clarion Plus uh, agenda. Uh, the first workshop, uh, which was very inspiring, took place a few months ago in Oxford on our history collections. Two more of these, uh, this type of workshop will take place in, in the coming year. One on uh, parliamentary records and... Uh, where are you, Petya? Ah, yeah, there. Uh, she will be uh, organizing that one somewhere in March, in possibly in, or most likely in uh, Bulgaria. So if you're interested, talk to Petya. Um, and there will be one on uh, social media data. Um, so that's part of the prehistory, the, this concept of um, data type, of workshop focused on specific data types. But of course, in the case of, of, of newspaper data, much more work has been done already on um, making the, uh, yeah, the process of making newspaper data available for um, uh, research purposes via online platforms. Um, so I hope that whatever has uh, been created in terms of knowledge and uh, technology, good afternoon, welcome, will be um, um, introduced here in the discussion as well so that uh, we can take it into account in the steps to be taken uh, here. Um, I'm not somebody who worked with newspaper data, uh, uh, but from things that I saw and read, uh, I have a, a sort of understanding of uh, what could be um, what could be achieved uh, through this type of workshop. Uh, so for me, the aim of for, for this workshop is uh, uh, the exploration of existing, existing and envisioned approaches uh, for analyzing newspaper archives with the use of, of Clarin compatible standards and, and processing tools. Um, and in the longer term, this should lead to uh, uh, an enrichment of the Clarion infrastructure uh, that provides easy access to, to newspaper archives and services that are suited for that data type. And that encourages uh, uh, researchers to develop and, and uh, address discipline specific hypotheses and, and, and scholarly questions. So um, if, if we are able to identify the needs of um, the communities that we want to serve in a more uh, elaborate way than uh, Clarin has been able uh, uh, to do up till now, then uh, Clarin will turn into an infrastructure that is, uh, um, has increased functionality for users of newspaper archives. But of course, in order to make that work, we need to be very careful about the needs of users. And one of the things that I learned from the Oxford workshops is that I should, that we shouldn't talk about users, but about researchers, because nobody who is, in, is looking for suitable tools and services is interested in being called a user. It's the people see themselves as researchers, so you shouldn't uh, talk too much about users as an abstract concept. But of course, in this particular slide, um, uh, I list a few of the very different stages within a research cycle in which newspapers play a role and the various uh, stages in the research cycle um, are not often not um, the steps taken by one individual researcher, by, but um, uh, this is actually uh, the description of uh, collaborative work where you could say uh, even if sometimes people don't work together, but everything starts with um, making data available in a digital format that is suited for a digital research infrastructure. So Data creation is a is, is very first step um, in which the creation of metadata is an important issue for almost all data types, but in this particular case, uh, all the elements coming from the fact that newspapers, 
the newspaper collections were not digital born, so OCR is then part of, uh, of this stage in the research. Um, then we often distinguish the uh, stage where the exploration of the data space uh, um, plays a, a central role in this for newspapers that means finding articles on a specific topic or a place or a person, but also uh, finding threats throughout uh, a newspaper collection from uh, a specific uh, title or a newspaper uh, title um, or a specific period. And then uh, there is the analysis stage, which is maybe at the heart of uh, the work of, of the kind of researches that we want to address here, and that is uh, annotation and the technology that uh, could play a role there is, is named entity detection. Um, something support, yeah, steps that could be supported by, uh, by text mining and, and steps that could be supported by link generation. And then uh, in the cycle, uh, an important stage is always uh, the presentation of, of the results that were gained. So citation of newspaper articles, uh, in this particular case, the recombination of, of text and image data um, and, and visualization of patterns. These are all things that uh, are tasks that uh, a research infrastructure for newspapers should somehow take into account in order to have happy researchers in the end. Um, like always, there are, are uh, challenges and there is potential. Um, newspapers uh, or newspaper archives are typically very rich in the sense that they uh, can be used in, in, in multiple ways because they have so many layers and so many um, uh, angles into them. So first of all, they, they are, to, to just mention a typical uh, digital humanities paradigm, they are suited for both close reading and for distant reading. This is the franco Moretti distinction um, that uh, if you take them together clearly describes the fact that if technology helps you to explore data in a more efficient way, distant reading, you can spend more of your time on close reading. So the two are not distinct, but uh, two sides of, um, of maybe the same coin. Um, newspaper archives are also challenging because they often present noisy or messy data. Uh, our keynote speaker, Joris, has messy in his title, so I suppose he will explain uh, more on, on this particular challenge later on. Um, and um, newspaper data is, is special because it's one of the data types that, that is calling for links to be generated between this, these textual resources and other modalities, uh, collections in other modalities than text, for example, a broadcast new news archives or um, uh, radio material from certain periods, etc. In terms of the potential for multidisciplinary work, there's, there's lots to be said, which I won't do because it's very, I've just a very, a few very superficial uh, observations. Um, um, but it's very clear also from the spread of, of profiles that you represent that um, there's interest in newspaper archives from many disciplinary perspectives. So that also means that the potential for multidisciplinary collaboration is, is very big. Um, from earlier work on, um, maybe I should say that first, I'm, I have a background in natural language processing, but I've been involved in several projects where we try to um, put the uh, technology to use for specific groups of researchers. Um, so I, I learned a few things there and, and I've also learned that these lessons are still relevant and, um, and um, so I would like to share a bit of those thoughts with you. They're not, not very specific, but it's good to have them at the table before we start working together here. And that is that 
um, uh, it's true that that uh, ambitions of of, of um, people that are not involved in the development of uh, uh, technology are not very ambitious in terms of the uh, the ways they would like to see technology to interfere with their way of working. So uh, they they're not very de researchers are not always very demanding in that respect. Uh, so a bit of technology push can be good, but it's very important that you keep in mind that that the tools that have to offer uh, um, uh, support for researchers um, should try to understand the existing workflows of, of researchers. Um, um, it, the development should to take um, the, the disciplinary methodological frameworks into account because otherwise if, if you don't understand the uh, existing workflow then uh, um, you will lose your researchers and your users uh, in the end. So the, the existing way of working should play a role in the design of, of new technology and or in, um, in new pipelines. Um, so scholarly insights and, and, and conclusions um, uh, can, all can only be taken serious uh, if, if there is the potential for validation and, and replication of the results. Um, otherwise there is no added value for the specific fields. And if the conclusions are reached based on uh, tools um, that are poorly understood, then they will be considered black boxes and they will not be considered to bring validation that, uh, um, that is needed to take the next step within the field. So um, good explanations and, and, uh, on the tools that are made available by the technical communities uh, are very welcome, but it should also be transparent how the outcomes of those components and modules could be compared to uh, um, uh, existing analysis models. Um, and maybe my last mes message uh, for today is that um, it's very clear that for multidisciplinary collaboration uh, or collaboration across boundaries, between humanities disciplines, between uh, social sciences, uh, but also between s technical people and scholars. Um, f in, this, in this collaboration there are many communication pitfalls and they will never stop uh, to exist. And the only solution is to, to talk to each other and to explain terminology and to try to understand each other's perspectives. Um, so I would recommend you to do that in, in the coming days, but also to, to continue uh, to talk to each other after this workshop, um, which I hope will be uh, bringing you a lot of inspiration and will bring lots of ideas at the table that, that Claring could take up to, uh, to take a next step.